All right. We are live now. Uh, so just to get everyone acquainted, uh, you can put your comments into the uh, comment section on Facebook or Twitter, and we will be uh, engaging with you. We'll be able to see the comments last. We'll be able to talk to folks uh, if Love you have it. any questions. And so it'll, it'll be great. And if there's any info you want us to share, I can put it in a banner at the bottom. Uh, and actually, let me let me do that now. So, so far, we have three folks that are watching. Uh, hello to everyone. Hey, y'all. Thank Here you for joining us. Is, yeah, is at Lash. Nolan. Nolan. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Let's see if that goes up. Yep. Look at that. This is like a professional production. Right. Look at, okay, CNN, watch out. <laughs> watch out, CNN. We're going to take it from the streets. Right, right. Yeah. Um, but for folks that are, are signing on, that are watching, please make sure to share. This is a conversation that we'll, we'll take our time with, uh, a conversation, again, about COVID-19, about health justice, critical race theory, racism during this pandemic, what it means to be in medical school from the perspective of LASH, and and what we should be looking out for in the future. Uh, so make sure to either share, comment, like it, so that other folks can chime in and, and can take a look. But this is the Praxis Podcast, the podcast I started out of the University of Washington School of Medicine, uh, a unique opportunity where we get to dig into the hard issues of critical race theory, racism, uh, the issues of social determinants of health of historically marginalized communities and what we should be doing to address those inequities. So. Uh, what we've been doing is having an audio podcast. You can check that out on Stitcher, on iTunes, on Google. You can check out the old uh, episodes. Feel free to listen. We cover, again, everything from race to community physicians uh, to systemic racism and white supremacy. Uh, but we also have special guests. And today we have a very, very special guest. Uh, you heard her name already, but Lash Nolan, who is a MS1, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Yep, yep. Yeah, so first year, for those that don't know, uh, first year medical student at Harvard Medical School. And uh, I'm going to start us off by asking you to tell us a bit about yourself. I know you come from Compton. And so maybe you can tell us what that journey was like, what it means for you. And then uh, I'll follow up with some more questions. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for having me. It's truly an honor to be here with you. Um, you're like a goat in the critical race theory and health equity and justice world. Um, but yeah, so I, I grew up in Compton, California, um, also spent parts of my life in Carson, California, uh, in Rancho Cucamonga. So my mom and I, we were really everywhere. And she pretty much raised me on her own as a single parent. And she was always the, the one who was pushing me to just be better and to reach my full potential. And she was the first person in our family to get her bachelor's degree, her master's degree. And I would just see her grinding all the time. And I was like, I have no choice but to grind because that's all my mom does. So I had this dream of becoming a doctor ever since I was in third grade after we won this science fair uh, first prize. And um, we like did this project with like some goldfish that we bought from Walmart. And it was like, we just scrapped it together real quick because I told her like the night before. <laughs> and, uh, and ever since then, I, I was just serious about this goal of becoming a physician. And it's crazy because I didn't actually see a physician of color until my first year of college, I actually did like a internship program here in Riverside where I shadowed physicians of color. And that was my first time actually putting this dream to an actual human being. And I was like, okay, like I can be you, you are a representative of me. And ever since then have just been hungry for bringing justice and equity to my people because I know that representation is important, but then we can't get that representation if we don't remove the systemic barriers keeping people from even getting opportunities. So um, after I graduated from Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, I spent two gap years. First gap year I was in Spain um, teaching English, doing public health research uh, through a Fulbright fellowship. And the second year I went to Chicago and I did a year of service with AmeriCorps. So I was working at a community health center doing health coaching and health education. And 
I lived on the south side, but my job was in the north side of Chicago. And every time I would get on the train, I saw how the demographics of the train would just shift. Like it never failed. Like I always knew that all the white folks was going to get off at this stop. And then all the black folks was going to still be chilling on there as we went, you know, further down south. And I started to just read a lot about policy. And I started to read a lot about how um, these historical wrongs against these communities are kind of baked into the society that we experience in Chicago and just across the US. And that's what really kind of gave me that impetus going into medical school. Like I can't just do medicine. I need to make sure that I'm staying aware of all of the other things that are informing health outcomes. And and that's how we ended up where we are today. So, yep. Uh, that's, that's, that's dope and amazing. And I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. I mean, my my mind goes to a place of there's a lot of youngsters that may be watching this or may see it or may have come across your article. I want folks to to check this out. I'm going to share this a bit. And, and before I I do that, got some, some love on the comments already. Hey. Uh, so let me see who's who's been commenting. Uh, oh, let me, let me turn this off. Wait, that's a sneak peek. Uh, <laughs> Marlene said, hey, cousin. Hey, cousin, what's going on? <laughs> we got Marlene. We got Sierra. Yes, that's my Sierra. that's my OG homie right there. Hey, girl. Wow. And then we got Los AmeriCorps. Okay. A picture. But, Getting things done. You got love from all over. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have folks in in LA and San Francisco. Look at that, John. Yeah, John's a good friend from San Francisco. So yeah, folks are watching, they're, they're sharing. Sierra said, we need more competent doctors tired of not being delivered. That's a real, that's a real concern and a real point. I don't, I don't know, Lush, if you want to speak on that. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I completely agree with that. And I think a lot of the issue is this lack of representation. Um, I think the fact that only about 2% of physicians are Black women and we represent a much greater part of our population, um, there's going to be this, it's just not going to be this concordance when we experience the healthcare system. And there have been many studies that have shown that um, black pain is not validated and black folks are not believed when they go to the doctor. And I think that that definitely all plays out in these health disparities that we see. The fact that black women are dying three to four times that of white women and childbirth and so many other inequities that we see in these statistics. And I think that we're going to see the same thing play out with COVID-19, right? Like if those things were already happening before, they're going to be further exacerbated when we're in a global pandemic like we are today. So Sierra, I definitely hear you and I'm sorry that that continues to be the experience of you and so many other people of color as they as they access healthcare in the US. Yeah, and it's and it's a real thing. Uh a thing that unless you live in that identity, uh most folks say, well I don't I don't understand what the problem is. Doctors are intelligent and they're smart. And it's like, yeah, you can be as smart as a rocket scientist. It does not mean that you have the ability to engage and to understand the historical context of why folks are coming into that clinic or they're presenting into that OR or having that surgery done. I, I, I tell my colleagues all the time, we can treat anyone that comes to the clinic for asthma, but unless we are actually addressing the systemic issues that those folks that are coming with asthma, which are at least here in Seattle, historically black and brown folks, mm -hmm. predominantly poor, that live in the area that have the highest rates of respiratory disease because of the pollution and the contamination. And that wasn't an accident, right? Right. And so yeah, we can give them an inhaler, but they're still going back to the community that caused the, the harm and the damage in the first place. So I think you and others and, and we are, are saying, we got to push, like being a physician and caring for folks goes beyond the four walls of that clinic. 100%, 100%. Because if, if we don't address the root cause, then we're just slapping on Band-Aids. And at some point, you know, we're going to run out of Band-Aids. So we got to get to the to the root of the hemorrhage. You know what I mean? That's real. You got Alicia that, that popped in. Hey! Yeah, that was my supervisor for uh, oh, National wow. Health Corps. Yep. <laughs> Your cousin showing love. 
Yes. Thank you, cousin. Oh, we have some some heavy hitters chiming in now. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> She's the truth, man. Right. I I remember listening oh, to her yeah. on the uh, on the uh, woke women of color um, podcast. podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, if if you want to get on this podcast, I would love to get as many voices as possible. So maybe Lash, you can put a plug in to 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 get her on here as well. Yeah, Doctor Zell, come through, come through. We lit <laughs> over here. <laughs> mm. And she made another point that BIPOC training and white supremacist health professions institution can still cause harm, and that's that's real, uh, and cause harm in so many different facets and and from different different perspectives, right? The folks doing the training can feel a significant amount of harm. The the folks having to constantly reiterate their positions of validity mm. to a predominantly white and white supremacist institution is is going to wear us down, right? And the data shows, particularly yeah. around black women, and, and you've probably seen the data, I know Dr. Zoe has, that black women bear a huge burden in carrying an academic medicine of just trying to survive and maneuver through it because it's a constant, oh, prove yourself. Show us that this is real academic rigor. Prove us that you can publish on this. And for the longest time, talking about race and racism and white supremacy was not something that academic medicine was going to give credit to. Mm -hmm. And they're barely doing it now. So I'm wondering if you have thoughts on it. Yeah, like, I mean, I first want to touch on this idea of just being like feeling this fatigue. You know, whenever I'm in class, I, I recently tweeted about how I feel like COVID-19 is going to result in a discussion about the pathophysiology of COVID-19 and how it all played out. And there's going to be one slide at the end that basically says like, oh, yeah, all the black and brown folks died at disproportionate rates. And, you know, we have so far to go, but we're doing great work. And, you know, that's going to be the end, the end of the presentation. And it happens with everything we learn. Like, and I always just look at another student of color and we just kind of sigh and shake our head and we'll like go in our group chat and be like, man, here we go again. And if it weren't for me reading and having that time during my gap years to really understand my history and understand that these numbers are not a reflection of me and my people just being inherently damaged, I think that it could really lead to a lot of internalized racism. And I think that that's very problematic that on top of you having to just show why you deserve to be in these spaces, you have to deal with this internal battle when you see these statistics constantly. And then if you wanna do that work, is it gonna be validated? Um, because I think academic medicine is still in this place where everything needs to be like biomedical sciences, you know, all the time. And um, the sociological stuff is, is important too. Yeah, that's real. And I teach a class at UW Medicine called the Critical Race Theory in Medicine. Maxie, yeah. this quarter is the quarter I teach it. And you got to say the response has been, this is the second year I've taught it, the response has been from medical students, this, this has to be part of the curriculum. Yeah. Why are we learning this as something that's ancillary to what is necessary? Uh, and for the folks listening, you may say, oh, you're talking a lot about medical education and medical school. I thought this was about COVID-19. And, and I would make the argument that unless we do right by the education of our medical providers, then we won't be able to do right by the care for our patients. And 100%. Real, yeah. Um, and, and I get plug help. I appreciate you, Dr. Zoe. I'll reach out. So Dr. Zoe said, DM me. I'm in. Hey. So we'll get Dr. Zoe on the, on the podcast and the live stream. Um, yeah, folks have been listening to the Praxis Um yeah, for sure, Elizabeth. Appreciate you. Um, I wanted to show this quickly. If folks hadn't seen it, to get a full grasp of who we're, we're talking to. Uh, let me scroll up. I went back in to read it because it was inspiring. Look yeah. at that picture. That's a good picture. Yeah, yeah. Yes. My girl Gretchen Ertle, man. She, she's great. Oh, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So, yeah, Lash Nolan, first black woman class president at Harvard Medical School. And, you know, I was thinking about this and I was like, 2020, or maybe it was 19, but, you know, 2020, they're still firsts. And I'm wondering, like, how that sat with you. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, 
for me, it was it was never about like becoming the first because for me, the fact that this was even a conversation in 2020, I wanted to just make sure that I wasn't the last. And interestingly enough, I found out after this article blew up that in 1778, around there, um, Dr. Vietta Johnson, she was like class chair. So it was like a similar leadership role, but student council hadn't formally been implemented at Harvard Medical School. Um, mm. But even between when she had that leadership role and now, that's like a long time to have a black female leader at, at Harvard Medical School. And, you know, it was interesting. The reason why she ran is because she wanted access to like these really nice nether textbooks, because I guess the president or like the person who had this role would have access to that. And uh, she said she never got her, she never got her textbooks, interestingly enough, oh, wow. but yeah, it's crazy. But I think that when I looked at student council and I saw who was represented, I didn't see many black people in particular. And I really wanted to take this as an opportunity to show number one, you belong here, you deserve to be here. And we can be the face of an institution like Harvard Medical School. And just in general, like I've always been involved in student government and student council. Like I did it from fifth grade all the way to undergrad. I was, you know, student body president. And I always saw it as a vehicle for change because people might think of student council and it's like, oh, you know, you plan events and, you know, you bring cool people on the campus for concerts and stuff. But no, like the, the, the student body president has access to the president. They have access to the deans. They have access to the funds. So you can really use your budget to, to do some really dope stuff. And I think the really awesome thing has been that, yes, like I'm, I'm our student body president, but I'm also someone who deeply cares about issues of equity and social justice. And that's just genuinely who I am. And that also can be represented in student council. So that's been a lot of the initiatives that we've done this year. And I think really now it's about creating this pipeline so that the next person of color, the next person who feels like they're underrepresented at Harvard Medical School, feels like they can take on a leadership role like this and make it their own. Yeah, that's real. Uh, and and I don't want us to forget the the point that it took 2020 for there to be a first black woman class president uh, mm. in, in, in the current time, right? In, in right. In history. Right. Um, and, and that hits me. Like when I read that, that was, that was the first, I mean, I was super proud. It's inspiring. I showed my wife who was a black surgeon here at UW. Hey. She had this huge grin and of excitement, showed it to our daughter. Oh. And, uh, I mean, that's the power of it, right? When you yeah. see someone who, uh, my niece, who is living with us from Texas, she uh, also saw the article and she's like, oh, we have the same hair. Right? Hey, and, yeah. And, and like when I like, was enamored with you and, and sometimes we, we've, set, we've seen this, we've heard it. A lot of people say, oh, you can be whatever you dream. But the truth is, is that you can, you can only be what you have ever seen. Like mm -hmm. if you haven't seen it before, then now we're making stuff up. And and great, dreaming dreaming is great. But when we can touch it and say, yeah, I know Lash Nolan, right? Lash Nolan went to Harvard Medical School. I know Auntie Estelle Williams. She's a surgeon at UW and attending. Mm -hmm. I know Dr. Zo like like folks can point to that as a real artifact. Right. That, that is is now a historical fact. Um I'm I'm wondering if you can tell folks, you know, maybe many folks aren't clear on what medical school is like what has that experience been like yeah yeah I, I definitely want to talk about my medical school experience um but before we move on I, I just want to make the point that um what what we say like you can't be what you can't see I think that's, that's so key and I think also it's important for society to take responsibility too because I recognize that I'm here and, and black women can see me and they can say like, yes, like that's who I wanna aspire to become. It's important for society to recognize that there are barriers that they have purposefully built to make it so challenging for certain folks to get to this, to this place. And I know that so many things had to go perfectly right for me to be here. Like my mom had to be 
tenacious and fearless with her grind and looking out for me and the right mentors and applying for like programs. And, and if I hadn't seen that black doctor my first year of college, who knows where I would be right now. So um, I just want like young girls out there to know that society also has to do their part too. And you can do whatever you put your mind to, but we got to make sure that we hold them accountable. Yeah, that's, that's real. And that's right. I mean, you can't be what you can't see, but most of the time, the reason we can't see it is, as you mentioned, the systemic and historical legacy of making sure that certain people don't get into certain spaces is not an accident. Right. There's an intentional, intentional purpose and act. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's real. And, and Sierra, you're, I think you're you're speaking truth to Sierra now, giving you the love. Oh so yeah, everything is critical in our journey. Um, yes. Yeah, I mean, feel free to touch as little or as much as, as you want as far as your your medical or med school, and and or maybe in relation to what that means now in a pandemic. Mm. How how you see this as either more necessary or what you think should be change during this process of learning to be equipped of the inequities that we're seeing now panning out during the pandemic yeah yeah definitely um so i can just briefly talk about like what the process is like to to go into medical school and first you do like the pre-med curriculum so you go to undergrad and you take like your year of general chemistry your year of organic chemistry and biology and all those subjects um, then you apply to med school and you're finally in medical school. And I think the really cool thing about being in medical school is like now I'm finally learning the things that I've always been passionate about learning. When I was in undergrad, I felt like I was always just proving myself to say, like, I deserve to be considered for medical school. And now that you're here, it's like you're learning because you really want to know this information to serve your patients and to be as competent as possible to get in the care that they deserve. And you're, you're grinding a lot, you know what I mean? I'm sure you talk to your students all the time, you know, you're studying six plus hours a day. And the dope thing about Harvard Medical School is that everything is pass fail. Um, so it's not like we're out here in the, like pre-med culture can be very hyper competitive and everybody's like, yeah, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna set the curve, et cetera. You know, it's just extra. And it's just really cool to just right. learn from my patients right now and to work with my classmates because these are going to be my colleagues one day. And I want them to be their best too, because they might be treating, you know, a patient that I refer to them, or they might be treating one of my family members or friends. So I think we all are, are pushing each other to become great. And um, I really love the experience of being at Harvard Harvard as well, because we have like all of our curriculum is interactive. So we have mandatory classes. We sit in groups of four. We go through patient cases and like you're constantly learning with other people. And I think that's what's made it really challenging during COVID-19 is everything is online now. So we were used to going to class every day, whereas at some med schools, classes are optional and they already kind of have a, a rhythm with, you know, doing their lectures recorded and things like that. So it's been a big transition for us. You know, we try to do our little breakout sessions on Zoom, uh, but it's been challenging for me because we start class at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time usually. And for the for the last couple of weeks, they've continued doing that. So I just watched the the recorded ones because I wasn't going to wake up at five o'clock in the morning. I was like, look, I love y'all, but uh-uh. <laughs> You're back in California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm back in California. Yeah. I should have clarified that. Yeah, yeah so I'm back yeah, in Cali. Yeah. Um, it's, it's so beautiful and sunny outside today, too. Um, but yeah, so it's it's definitely been challenging and in, in just like adjusting to this new groove. And the other really cool thing about our curriculum is we see patients every Wednesday. So, you know, we start to see patients our first year, um, like first month of school. And now we're doing everything via telemedicine. And I think the the cool thing about it has been is like we're also going through this change like with our preceptors, with our faculty. So it's not like we're in this alone. Everybody's trying to figure out, you know, how we're gonna go about this. But I think it also has been challenging to know that, you know, our healthcare system is at capacity right now and my preceptors have to stop what they're doing to, to teach me. And it's important and I'm happy that they're doing it, but sometimes I feel a little guilty because I'm wondering if their talents could be used elsewhere in a, in a way that might be more urgent. Mm, yeah. yeah. 
And for folks that are just joining us, uh, I'm here with Lash Nolan. If if you don't know Lash, uh, first year Harvard medical student, first black woman, student body president, uh, speaking to us just about the experience of med school, growing up, what it means to be in med school during this pandemic. Uh, I'm wondering if you can speak to the discussions. Oh, and before we get there, uh, yeah. if you're watching, please remember to share, to like, leave a comment. We'll put it up on the screen. We'll discuss. Uh, we did have one question from someone. Uh, let's see what we got. It was about, it said, can you speak on the attitude that medical professionals should should do biomed and not advocacy? And so I think the question is that should you focus on the biomedical elements of medical education, medical practice, and the quote unquote, just the science versus the advocacy. And then he follows up with, is there, is there a problem with doing both? Mm. Yeah, I think that this has definitely been a, a hot topic since um, there's been a, a certain physician, and I think some other folks have been on like the Wall Street Journal coming out with articles and stuff saying that physicians need to focus on the medicine and not on social justice and advocacy. And I personally think that you you need both. And I think traditionally we've only done one and that clearly isn't working for us. We clearly still have health disparities. We clearly still have people who are dying at disproportionate rates. And I think that it's important for physicians and, and the physicians in training to have a holistic understanding of their patients' lives outside the clinic. Because if I give my patient insulin and they have their med and I already you know, have the prescription filled, um, if they're unable to pick that up or if they don't have access to to a refrigerator for to refrigerate their insulin or just so many different things like their ability to access the clinic, then they aren't going to get their the, their ideal healthcare outcomes or the most optimal healthcare outcomes. And I think those are the things that physicians need to understand in order to really provide the best care to their patients. So I think that you need a, a mix of both. And I think traditionally we've been focusing on the biomedical sciences side and that isn't working in the 21st century. So we need to adjust. Yeah, I saw that article that came out and I would pull it up, but essentially, especially during the pandemic, it was a former uh, dean of curriculum, if I'm not mistaken, at a mm -hmm. medical school, big medical school. And he wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal uh, maybe like four months ago. That yeah. said learning about environmental justice and social justice is taking away from our medical professionals from having a good grasp of the science. And we're making poor doctors as a result and and i'm paraphrasing and that's not that's not the quote right and he came up with an article uh may have been a couple of days ago where he's now saying that um it furthers his point that by focusing on justice we didn't have the opportunity or, or physicians in training didn't have the opportunity to learn about the necessities of addressing a pandemic and it's it's interesting to hear an older white dude mm -hmm. talk about and telling medical students in medical schools that they shouldn't be teaching social justice and equity, that it, it distracts the students. And the position that I typically take, and I have some colleagues that believe that, um, the position I take is, well, the problem is you think that justice isn't science. And when you have that thing, then yeah then for you, it's not science. But what I try to describe in my classes and my talks is that when we talk about racism, when we talk about systemic and inherent biases and historical traumas and white supremacy and settler colonialism and patriarchy, this isn't an opinion, right? These are duly studied professions and domains that people have committed their lives to the same way physicians do, right? The same way physicians who say, and the example I usually give my colleagues is if you are a family doctor and someone comes in with a broken femur, a broken leg, you don't say, oh, that's okay, I'll do the surgery. You say, let me refer you to an orthopedic surgeon because they have better expertise in doing that. Well, right. that means that we should re be relying on the folks who have done the work in understanding these social components of the world to come in and teach our students, which I do, which Dr. Zoe does, which many amazing folks have done. 
but we have constantly felt this push of, oh, well, that's not real medicine, Edwin. Like, I don't actually know why you're talking about these things. Like, how, how is this related to medicine? And I tell folks, look, if you treat a patient that doesn't look like you, it's related to medicine. <laughs> Facts. You, need to understand, you need to understand the history. You need to understand the criticality that these folks may not trust you because you have a white coat on. Right. And what most of the physicians may say is, well, I don't understand why they don't trust me. And I said, well, I can tell you because if you did social, political, historical, rigorous uh, education or at least reading, you would understand that the Tuskegee experiment is still something that many communities, particularly the black community, still holds in their conscious. That's, that's not a forgotten fact. And I call it a genocide. I call it the Tuskegee genocide because there's an intentional act to see black men die at the hands of syphilis even after a cure was created, mm -hmm. right? even after penicillin was around. So it's, it's a constant struggle. I'm wondering, have you seen that, right? Ha have you seen that struggle? Is it a struggle that is playing out in, in your educational experience or maybe more broadly in, in talking to folks around the country? Yeah, yeah, most definitely. I think that schools are definitely doing better than they were like 10 years ago. But I think what frustrates me is this conversation about the social and political impacts of folks' every, everyday experiences on their health. It's still seen as like an optional thing to learn about. And I think that it definitely should not be optional. I think these, these should be ingrained things that are a part of curriculums and I think traditionally it's it's number one is it'll, it'll probably be like a lunch talk, right? Like I think a lot of folks will be like, yeah, you know, we're we're gonna you know provide you with some pizza and we're gonna have this speaker come in and they're gonna talk about critical race theory. Um, and then the second issue with that is that usually it's put on by the students. Like usually the students are the folks who have to bring in these people. Um, and then the the other issue is that when we do have these conversations they aren't the professionals who are leading them. They're faculty members who might be cardiologists, pulmonologists who were given um, a curriculum or a piece of paper or some slides to read and, and they're just citing these things. And often the students end up teaching majority of the class because the professors are grossly unprepared to have these deep conversations. And it's like, if, if, if I were gonna take a class on heart failure, you wouldn't have a pulmonologist or an endocrinologist teaching me a class on heart failure. So if we're gonna talk about social justice and critical race theory, don't have somebody coming in here who's not qualified to teach me this material because it's just gonna, it's not doing our patients justice, it's not doing our students justice. And if we're, if we're not gonna do it right, then I mean, I, I would say not do it at all, but I don't wanna say that but they need to get it together at the end of the day, you know, right. <laughs> it's getting get it, they need to get it together. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. And, and why Ryan, Ryan Huerto, a good, good friend and brother. Uh, yeah. That's my UCSF, guy. UCSF, yep. At university of Michigan, a fellow will be, uh, an attending soon somewhere. Ooh. But, uh, the article we were talking about, uh, in the wall street journal was written by the former Dean at UPenn. So not a small school. Mm. Um, and that's an important fact is that, at the biggest schools, right, the most prominent schools in the country, this is still these conversations of justice and, and health justice are are at a slow creep. And I was just watching. Oh, where is it? I'm going to pull it up. I was just watching an amazing video uh -huh. um, that Dr. King's family posted on Twitter, and it was him talking about and I think she posted it today. It was it was him talking about there is no better time than now, right? And and he said that time is neutral because most people say, oh, time will heal all. And Dr. Right. King was talking about, no, time is neutral. Time doesn't take a position on these issues of injustice. And actually, the only time that we have is right now. And so that means if we wait, then time actually sits on the side of oppression, Mm. And so we should be doing the work right now because the longer we wait, the more oppressed, the compounding of that oppression takes place. And I just loved it. I, I love seeing that. And I'm going to try to find it while, while we're here. But uh, it, it really oh, yeah. That. Send that to me. No, thank you for. Yeah, I will. And let me yeah. see if I can actually just, just pull it up. Uh, do you want to share? I mean, we're in the heart of COVID. This is yeah. a real pandemic. Folks are shelter in place. 
and the number of inequities that are rising as a result of that, like many people are seeing it. I mean, we're, we're privileged to be able to be at home, having technology, connecting to the internet, um, having these conversations. And then at the same time, there's folks in the streets, there's folks who don't have housing, there's folks in prisons, there's folks in detention centers, there's families who lost their jobs with unemployment getting to about 17 million people. Um, I'm wondering how, how you're thinking about it and, and how you're feeling about it and, and just what your thoughts are. Yeah. Um, so so for me, as soon as I started to hear about how COVID-19 was just getting worse, I had this feeling that exactly what we're seeing now was going to happen. And the first folks that I spoke to at Harvard were the custodial staff. Um, that, that's like my family. I talk to them every day. Um, they help me keep my Spanish on top of the game. Um, they, those are my those are my people. And I I asked them, I was like, you know, how have you been prepared or like what education have you gotten about COVID-19? And they were just like, well, you know, they just, you know, gave us some extra gloves and, and told us to clean more than normal. And I was like, but what do you know about COVID-19? And they just felt like it, or to me, it, it felt like they really didn't know the, the gravity or the danger of the situation. And that was when I first heard this idea of essential staff. And they were telling me that even in the case of a snowstorm or if the school was shut down, they still have to come in because they're considered essential. And I was like, really? Like, that's so interesting to me um, that even if like we're getting evacuated, like everyone was in a frenzy because everybody had to get evacuated. And in my role as president, I was working with administration to make that happen. And I was then looking at the security guards who worked the front desk at our at our on campus housing. And they were looking like, so like, are we still going to have a job? Like, where are you guys going? And it just seemed like the folks who were the essential staff and would most likely have to stay and be put in compromising positions during this during this outbreak, they weren't prepared and they weren't being kept in the loop. And a lot of these individuals were immigrants. Um, English was not their first language. So I was really wondering, even if there was correspondence, how were they ensuring that everyone had access to that information? Um, then I called my grandpa because, you know, he is over 65, he's a truck driver, he has diabetes and hypertension. So as I learned about all of these different risk factors, I was like, Gramps, like, you need to stop working. And he was like, I can't, you know, I have to keep working. And mm -hmm. everything just started to connect more and more because when I finally got back to California, my mom and I, we had to go stand in line for toilet paper because they were only given, you know, one roll of toilet paper uh, per person. And that was super interesting because I was like, well, in order for the toilet paper to get to the store, a truck had to bring it here, right? Everybody was waiting for the truck to offload the toilet paper. So I started to think about, you know, how is our society running? What are the moving parts and who, who are those individuals who are running those moving parts? And I came to the conclusion that a lot of the CEOs and the individuals who own these businesses and, and make a lot of money and who are wealthy because of it, they get to work from home because all they have to do is sit at home, send emails, get on phone calls. But the workers who have to be out there every single day and are so essential to keeping our society going, you know, they're not receiving the education that they need, the protection that they need. And even in our conversation about PPE, it's been interesting to see the hierarchy because I want my preceptors and I want those healthcare workers to get access to PPE. But I think those individuals who are delivering mail every day, who are dropping off packages, who are making sure that, you know, we're able to check out our food at the grocery store. I think they also need access to PPE. And I've seen it time and time again, like who are the heroes of this pandemic? And of course the physicians are out there on the front lines, but I think that there are other people who are also out there on the front lines who we see every day, but we not, might, might not recognize them as heroes because we associate them with such normal, mundane, every part, you know, everyday parts of our lives. And I think that that's, that's really been interesting to see in all of this. Yeah, that's, that's so and I think those are the folks we should be keeping at top of mind because up until this pandemic, and, and you're making this point, up until this pandemic, uh, sorry, let me get my the camera up. <laughs> you get it.
All right, we should be good to go soon. There we go. Okay. Uh, up until this pandemic, the the folks that you just mentioned were historically the ones that that were not thought of as essential. Mm. Right. Right. They, they were like, oh, you have a minimum wage job. You have a a job that doesn't pay well. And come to find out, it's the job that we all rely on. Mm -hmm. And I hope that this pandemic reconstructs the idea of labor, reconstructs the idea of what is essential so that once we get out of this, we are actually giving, giving a lot of the care and the need and reconsidering if, if work is what people rely on for this insurance that they need to right. get care for this pandemic and folks are getting laid off. Th these are real conversations we need to have that have deep ethical and, and equity issues. And Dr. Zoe made a comment just now and said, even in a pandemic, physicians still have a lot of social, political, and economic privilege. Yeah, without mm. a doubt. Um, and, and, yeah. I mean, yeah. I see it and I see it. And so it's, it's putting that privilege in, in place, identifying it. And I think figuring out how that privilege can be used to, to benefit other folks. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, I uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, um, like this conversation about privilege that we're having too, it's been interesting to see the, the initial policies that first came out, um, from the CDC and from, our our governments here, how they were saying like, okay, we need to you know do social distancing, wash your hands, um, you know for for twenty seconds or thirty seconds, and and with soap and water. And I was just really thinking about like who has access to those things, right? Like you know we have so many folks here incarcerated. You know we have the highest incarcerated population in the world, and we also have folks who are on reservations who were put there by our government. And they don't. They might not have access to to water and and soap and the things that they need. So I think that even in the way that the policies were being rolled out, they weren't necessarily thinking about the conditions that they have actually supported people being under and how they were going to be able to actually follow those policies and what that was going to look like for them. So I think that this conversation about privilege is really something that should be at the center of of how we discuss COVID-19 and its impacts. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. We got we got some more love on here. Robert Chu, a friend of mine, said thank you all for putting this together. And then thank uh, you. Both, hey Bernie. Both friend, Bernie said, what's going on? Uh how you doing, Bernie? I hope that's my are, girl. Everyone actually is is safe and healthy. Uh and I know y'all are doing some amazing organizing down in the bay. So thank you, Bernie, for for doing that at UCSF. Uh and uh, it's necessary. It's necessary work. Um, I don't want to take the whole hour. I just, I feel like this has been an amazing conversation so far. I appreciate you joining us. The Praxis podcast will be doing more live streams. The goal is to do uh, Wednesday or Friday. So if, if you tap in, make sure to subscribe or like, or uh, you can listen to the podcast on your, your podcast streaming service. Uh, but we'll get other folks on here to talk about COVID, the health justice issues related to that. Uh, if you're just tuning in, we have Lash Nolan, Harvard medical student, talking about how this experience has been affecting her, how she thinks about it, and just a brilliant mind to, to be able to share some knowledge with us. I appreciate it. And I did find the uh, the audio of Dr. King. You're going to have to tell me if you can, if you can hear it. I'm okay. sure you've heard this idea. It is the notion almost that that is something in the very the very fourth time that will miraculously cure all evil. And I've heard this over and over again. There are those, and they're often sincere people, who say to Negroes and their allies in the white community that we should slow up and just be nice and patient and continue to pray, and in 100 or 200 years, the problem will work itself out because only time can solve the problem. I think that is an answer to that myth. And it is that time is neutral. It can be used either constructively or destructively. And I'm absolutely convinced that the forces of ill will in our nation, the extreme rightness in our nation, 
have often used time much more effectively than the forces of goodwill. And it may well be that we will have to repent in this generation not merely for the vitriolic words of the bad people and the violent actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence and indifference of the good people who sit around and say, wait on time. Somewhere we must come to see that social progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and the persistent work of dedicated individuals. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the primitive forces of social stagnation. And so we must help time, and we must realize that the time is always right to do right. Yeah, and I, I share that on Twitter. You can check it out. Feel free to share it. But I, he just spoke so much truth in that, right? And and I think it's a good place to to end our wonderful conversation. And I hope we encourage, and I'll make sure you have the last word, but I want to encourage folks listening, the folks who, who share this and the folks listening to them, that during a pandemic, it's not as if racism stops or that inequities just go on pause, or that all the bad things just end up disappearing because there's something more urgent that we have to care for. The reality is, is that it gets exacerbated, that it becomes more acute, and that it becomes heavier. And I would argue that the pandemic is actually showing us exactly how this country has been operating for centuries but it didn't care before, right? The health inequity numbers of black folks dying at higher rates of Latino folks in other cities dying at higher rates wasn't a concern before the pandemic. And I'm speaking of the general public. It wasn't a concern of theirs, but because now people are going online and looking at numbers on a daily basis of who is dying of COVID-19, now you can't run away from the inequity because we have to, we have to count it. And by, by counting it, you have to see it. It's in your face. And it's been counted before, but it hasn't been in folks' face. And so what I'm going to ask, and hopefully reiterating what Dr. King said, reiterating what Lash is saying, that I want us to contemplate what is the justice that we're going to fight for right now, whether it's in our home, whether it's organizing, whether it's making the phone call, whether it's seeing your elder that's down the block to make sure they're good, whether it's making sure that folks or kids that don't have food at school are getting that food, what are we going to do right now? Because if, if we don't do it and we think time will heal this or that just in time we'll be safe, I'm going to say that's a farce. It's a lie. There's going to be folks that are going to be so much worse off as a result of this. And we have to contemplate now what we're going to do. So I, I'm going to leave that there. And Lash, if you have any final words before we uh, shut it down. Yeah, no, you hit the nail on the head with that. And I just want to say that to all of my folks who are in medical education, to community, community leaders, those who have access to, to really making a difference and in, in moving these conversations and really making an impact. Um, I don't wanna see this become a slide at the end of a presentation about COVID-19. I don't wanna see this become a dissertation topic about health inequity and, and justice. I don't wanna see it become a special grant that's established at a medical school to do this work because people build entire careers off of studying health disparities, but we never get to the action part of it. And this is showing us that it's time to act. And I, am, I implore folks to start acting because we've done enough talking, we know why it's happening, and it's time to really do the work. So that's right that. Yeah, right on Lash. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you everyone that put the comments on. I'm going to share a bit. Uh, we got Annie says, thank you for being here. Your voices are a necessary part of the pandemic dialogue. Stay well. Ryan saying thank you. So much love to everyone that's watching, who left comments, who liked. Uh, it will be on whatever social media site you're, you're seeing. You can share it. The recording will be there. Again, you can go check out the Praxis podcast on your streaming service. And we'll be here again. Make sure to stay tuned. Uh, make sure to follow Lash. Thought Leader, 
among the ranks of, of her colleagues. And so again, thank you. Much love and, uh, and be safe out there. All right. Thank you for having me. This was beautiful. I appreciate you. Right on. Cool. All right.